Well, I'd like to uh, welcome everybody. Why don't we get started? Uh, before I forget, I want to remind everybody that this uh, visit of Yvette, uh, Perfect, Dr. Yvette Perfecto, has been supported by the Storer Endowment. And I will keep this very brief, because many of you heard this yesterday, that uh, Yvette is currently the James E. Crowfoot Collegiate Professor of Environmental Justice. Her work is distinguished by a combination of uh, really intriguing scientific investigations of food webs and interactions among species, coupled with looking at uh, social justice aspects and looking at aspects of real applications of the work. And uh, we are really thrilled to have her here. And since I'm sh much certain you would much rather hear from uh, Yvette than from me, uh, let me just say the title is Using Natural History to Understand the Complexity of a Tropical Agro agro ecosystem and uh, one last thing when it comes time for questions there may there are people on zoom so we'll use the mic great thanks thank you can everybody hear me is this okay yeah okay great well when when alan asked me for a title i had no idea what i was going to talk about so that was general enough <laughs> and i have filled in the gap a little bit now the title is Using Natural History and Theory to Understand the Maintenance of Ant Diversity in a Tropical Agroecosystem. And before I get started, I want to recognize a whole bunch of people that have been uh, pivotal for, for this research. And that includes uh, a lot of our graduate students and uh, uh, the technicians that have been collecting data for us uh, throughout the years and some of the farmers that have graciously, you know, allow us to work on their farms. Uh, and this work is in, in collaboration with John Vandermeer, who's my, my partner, my husband, my friend, and uh, we work together all the time And our labs, our joint labs. So uh, basically this is also his, his work. And actually he's, he's more of a theoretical ecologist. So some of the work that we do is a combination of empirical and theoretical work and kind of fit into each other. And you'll see in my presentation how, how that happens. Uh, and so a lot of the, uh, the, the simulations and stuff like that is done by him. OK, so uh, I consider myself an agroecologist. And I talked yesterday about what agroecology uh, is. And uh, I mentioned that agroecology is uh, a practice, a movement, and a science. And I'm mostly in, uh, doing work in the science of agroecology. Uh, and today I want to talk about that, you know, the, the science of agroecology. And yesterday in my talk, I gave like a little, little glimpse of the type of work that I do. And today is going to be a little bit more, um, more substantial about really the ecology of, of this agroecosystem. Uh, and. Um, so the science of agroecology, as I, as I put here, uh, consists of trying to understand the ecology of the agroecosystems to design and manage systems that are sustainable and productive. And so uh, within that very broad scope, I'm interested in ecological interactions among organisms uh, in the agroecosystem that might contribute to reducing pests and diseases. So a lot of my work is with arthropods and, uh, and looking at their interaction and how those interactions contribute to maintaining the farms without you know, pest outbreaks and disease outbreaks. One of those groups of organisms that I have been doing a lot of work with are ants. And uh, ants can have a complicated relationship uh, with other organisms, with pests and diseases in the system, sometimes positive, sometimes negative, uh, sometimes neutral. And, uh, but for the most part, then te they tend to be the outcome or the net effect of the ants tend to be positive. And I want to start then with uh, just, just a, a little bit of, of uh, a, an overview of the role of ants through this meta-analysis that, that we conducted uh, uh, with uh, Anojos, is the, the first author of this paper uh, from Brazil. 
and basically it's a meta-analysis on the impact of ants in agroecosystems. And uh, in this meta-analysis that was based on like 52 studies, uh, the final the final data set that we used was 52 studies with about 800 uh, comparisons, cases or comparisons of, uh, these were mostly experiments where ants were excluded. So comparison of plants with ants and without, without ants. And uh, the overall effect uh, of the ants on the crops tended to be positive. Although we did not find an effect on pest abundance, as you can see here, there's this, this is a non-significant effect. And there was a slightly negative effect on other natural enemies. So that's one of the negative, potentially negative effect that ants can have. You know, they, they can eat other natural enemies. Uh, we did find an overall positive effect or ne an overall negative effect on plant damage, that is the, the, the plants that have the ants tend to have lower uh, plant damage, and we, have, we found a positive effect on yield. So the overall net effect of the presence of the ants in, uh, on the plants uh, tended to be uh, positive. Now, this, this result here, this non-significant result, is partially due to the fact that some pests are uh, honeydew producing pests and some pests are not honeydew producing pests. And so here you have the hermipterans and the ants have normally, uh, there are a lot of ants that have mutualistic associations with hemipterans. And so here is clearly, you can see clearly that in terms of the effect on the pest abundance, when you separate it between uh, honeydew producing a pest and non-honeydew producing, well, let's call them herbivores, that there is a significant difference there, no? The ants obviously are having a positive effect on the honeydew producing ones and a negative effect on the non-honeydew producing ones. And that was, uh, that was especially true for pest abundance, but also uh, to some extent for, for, for plant damage. And uh, when you look at, at the non-honeydew producing uh, pest. And then finally, another important uh, result of this, or relevant to what I'm going to be talking about today, is that when you compare, you separate that into shaded crops and non, or uh, shaded crop and monocultures, uh, you see that most of the effect that the ants, the positive effects that are, that are um, uh, reported for ants are in these shaded crops. And I think, so we didn't find, for example, here is abundance uh, of non-honeydew producing pests, you know, with ants negative effect. So the ants are basically uh, a, having a negative effect on this non-honeydew producing pest in the shaded crops, but not in the monoculture. The same thing here for plant damage, no, a negative effect in the shaded crops, but not in the monoculture. And in terms of yield, the same thing, an effect in the shaded crops, but not in the monoculture. And I think it's because in monocultures, uh, you, and you have um, a less diversity of ants, basically. And, uh, and some of these monocultures were animal crops also. And so you have more disturbance of the soil and things like that. And so less abundance of ants and diversity of ants. So uh, with that, uh, that brings me then to my study system, which is, which is the coffee uh, agroforestry system. And coffee is a great study system because it, it is produced in different ways. It can be arranged uh, uh, in kind of an intensification gradient like the one you see here. And uh, uh, there's a lot of work that has been done in the coffee system that showed that as you move in this, along this intensification gradient, biodiversity is reduced. So you have lower diversity in these more intensified systems, like, like you know, the, the monoculture or shaded systems that have very, very little diversity of shade trees, et cetera, uh, than in these more diverse agroforestry systems. And we have some, uh, this is some data from long time ago for ants in particular, where you can see that along, the, this is a, an intensification index here. So here you will have the monocultures and here you will have the, the agroforestry system. And these plots here are forest plots. So these are 
forest uh, inside the forest, and these are the, the uh, agroforestry system. And as you can see, in terms of species richness, this agroforestry system managed to maintain uh, the, the species richness. Uh, and there's a lot of overlap of species. It's not completely uh, like, you know, there are certain species that you can only find in the forest. But in terms of species richness, uh, it's, it's pretty similar to the, to the forest, and in some cases even higher than, than the forest. Now, about five years ago, I started working in Puerto Rico. Most of my work has been in Mexico and a little bit in Costa Rica early on. Uh, but, but about five years ago, I started working in Puerto Rico. I'm from Puerto Rico. And in Puerto Rico, even though you do find all these different systems, you know, from the very diverse uh, rustic system or, you know, very diverse forest-like structure systems to the coffee monoculture, most of the coffee farms are actually kind of in the middle. So you have most of them, like in this, in this area here, what Moguel and Toledo, for those of you who are familiar with, with this literature, what they call the, the, uh, the traditional, uh, the commercial polyculture system. And here's a picture of, of one of them. So the, the data that, the, the study that I will be presenting to you takes place mostly in these kinds of systems. Um, okay, so using tuna baits, which is uh, my, my, my favorite tool to use for sampling ants, uh, using tuna baits, uh, we sample the ant community in 25 farms in, uh, throughout the coffee growing region in Puerto Rico with a gradient uh, of intensification, but a lot of them were in that uh, middle range that I showed you before. And, uh, and so we documented these species taking into consideration that Puerto Rico is an island, it's a relatively small island, so species richness is relatively low, which actually is really good for studying the ant community, because you, it's, it's, you, you can have a better handle at the community when you have 15, 20 species than when you have 200 species like we have in Mexico. And so uh, these are the species that we found. Anybody here study ants and are familiar with the ant community? No. Oh. Okay. Well. Um, so those those are the species that we that we uh, found there, and then uh, with the, the species rank that you can see here, we basically found that uh, there are three species, actually four species. These four that you see here, four species that are kind of way up there in terms of abundance. You know, they're they're very abundant, uh, but one of them which is this one, uh, Tapinoma melanocephala, it's very abundant, but just in a few farms. So I'm not considering that. I'm now considering the three top most abundant species in most of the farms. And those are, um, those are uh, uh, Wasmania aeropuntata, uh, Solenopsis invicta, and Monomorium floricola. All three non-native species in Puerto Rico, but have been there for, for quite a long time. But anyway, that's, that's also important. A lot of the, of the most abundant species in the community are non-native non species. Okay, so here we have, you know, these this, uh, three species, or the, the main three species that I'm gonna be talking about, Aguasmania aeropuntata, uh, Solenopsis invicta, and Monomorium floricola. From now on, I'm gonna just say Wasmania, Solenopsis, Monomorium, okay? And, and I'm referring to these three particular species. Now, um, let's see. This is not wanting to advance, okay. There is an extensive literature uh, on competition among ants, uh, a, and um, it basically, it, the, uh, the literature, when you review the literature, you come to the conclusion that communities of ants are structured primarily through competition. So uh, there's a lot of papers that have been uh, written about this, many studies documenting a transitive hierarchy among the ant community. And uh, here are some of the studies that, that you know, have uh, documented that some of the literature going back to the, to the 80s or ma mainly through the 90s. Uh, and this review, by, this review here by, the, uh, by Sim uh, Cerda, uh, they review all that literature in 2003. Oh, I didn't bring my glasses. 
Ooh, that's might be a problem. Well, anyway, 2003, I think it was. Can you see the date there? 13. Okay, 2013. Uh, and that review paper, basically, they concluded that, yes, you know, most of the literature show that, uh, that, that there is, uh, a, that, that ant communities are organized in this kind of competitive hierarchy. Uh, but they also pointed out uh, the, that there are other factors that can disrupt these competitive hierarchies. And those factors include colonicide, and this is, this is the work by, uh, by uh, Todd Palmer from here. He's still here, no? Todd Palmer is, is here in Davis? But, oh no, where is he now? I don't know. <laughs> well, yeah, he, he was here at some point in time, but he's, he's been doing some work related to the ant community in acacia plants in Africa and manipulate, they did some stuff, really neat studies manipulating the ant community, basically manipulating the size of the colony. And when you change the size of the colony, you change that hierarchy, you know, so that you can, you can alter the hierarchy with these changes in the size of the colony. But also, uh, when you have a, a top predator, that, uh, that can affect also that hierarchy when you, know, you have a, a, a predator, and that's the work that uh, LeBron and, and Morrison have done with forid, forid flies uh, and how they affect ant communities and how the, forid, the presence of the forid fly affects that hierarchy. And then uh, it's seen, uh, Cerda also has documented uh, how temperature also can disrupt those uh, hierarchies, of dominance hierarchies in the ant communities. So there are certain factors that can alter that, but overall there is a strong support for the idea that these communities are organized in some, some sort of dominance hierarchy of competition. Now, uh, for those of you who are not familiar, I mean, I think that most of you here are familiar with the concept of transitivity. Uh, so these are transitive hierarchies. And what is transitivity? Well, you know, the, the classical example of, a, of transitivity is height. So you have height here, Gifan is higher than Cara, Cara is higher than Rosa. That means that Gifan is higher than Rosa, no? That's a transitive, uh, a transitive uh, a, a characteristic, no? Um, and so you can translate that basically in, in, in ecology. We illustrate that, uh, that transitive competition uh, by looking at one axis, one niche axis, like here, you have this niche axis, and then here you have some measurement of fitness. No? And when you have something like this, this is species four, species five, species six, species seven, when you have something like that, that means that species Four wins in competition over species five, species five over species six, and so on and so forth. No? And, but you can also have a transitive hierarchy. So this, this we call a transitive chain. Uh, it's possible that this species doesn't at all interact with species five. No? So you know, it's just like species, species four. Uh, is competitively superior or com you know, can exclude species five, species five, species six, et cetera. But when you have a hierarchy, a transitive hierarchy, it looks more like this, no? So this is the niche axis, whatever it is, and this is the, the measurement of fitness, and that means that species four wins in competition over species five, four, I mean five, six, five, six, and seven. Is that? No. I should wear my glasses. <laughs> huh? Oh, three. I started with three here. Okay, three wins over species four, four over five, it's, and so on and so forth. But basically, this eventually, you know, you're gonna get a complete exclusion, and you're gonna get this this species to win in competition. So in this in this case, species three is the dominant species, and eventually, it will exclude all other species. Now, uh, you can have intransitive competition as well, like the, the, like the game Caesar, Paper, Rock, no? And you're, you're all probably familiar with this. This means that, uh, you know, Caesars win over Paper, Paper wins over Rock, and Rock wins over Caesars. And so translating that to our community, we have Wasmania winning in competition over Monomorium, Monomorium winning in competition over Solenopsis, 
but Solenovs is winning in competition over Wasmania. Now, you can illustrate that, uh, you cannot illustrate that with a single axis, no, a single niche axis. You need two niche axes to have this intransitivity. So here we have species one, uh, we have a chain, no, species one, I mean, uh, an intransitive, uh, no, we have a chain for species one over species two, species two over species three, but this is along one niche axis. Then along the second niche axis, you have species three winning over species one, species one over species two. And so that gives you then an intransitive uh, competition and it, it basically is an intransitive loop that you have there. Uh, and this can uh, basically maintain uh, species diversity in the system because contrary to having a hierarchy where eventually one species is going to win over all the other species in competition, you have uh, basically a cyclical. Uh, you have all these three species depending on the, on the competition coefficient. You, know, you can have either a stable equilibrium with, with well, a stable focal point with all three species being maintained or you have cyclical uh, a, what is called an, a hetero, a heteroclinic cycle where one species it is, is, is winning in competition, then the other one, then the other one. So that's, uh, that also you know, helped maintain uh, species, species diversity. So going back to our three species system, what evidence do we have to support this idea that they engage actually in an intransitive competition? No? Um, and we began thinking about this because there were a few studies published about how these species interact. These are very common species in many uh, disturbed areas, no? And in many agroecosystems. So uh, we started looking at the literature. And first, let's look at this, this uh, basically pairwise uh, interactions between the different species. So we have first Wasmania versus Monomorium. So for us to have an intransitive loop with these three species, Wasmania needs to win over, over Monomorium. And uh, we do have some literature that tend to indicate that that's the case. It's not the same species of monomorium, but it's another species of monomorium. This is a work by Von Schack uh, that was done. She was a student of uh, Deborah Gordon, looking at the interaction between Wasmania and a bunch of other species. And one of the species was monomorium a different species of monomorium. But uh, interestingly, what they found was that even though uh, monomorium was winning in, uh, in terms of uh, getting to a resource faster and actually acquiring more resources than Wasmania, eventually Wasmania will go back to the nest of monomorium and kill them all and eat them all and eat their brood and everything. And so uh, eventually Wasmania actually won in competition when, when they have these experiments. And this, this data is from very short term experiments like you know, a couple of days or something like that. And you can see here uh, the, I, I think I'm gonna have to wear my glasses, I'm sorry. Let me put my glasses because I can't see my own slides. Okay, here, here. Okay, so uh, we have here average number of dead workers. And so you have here Wasmania and, um, and, and, and the, the, sol the monomorium species. It's a different, as I mentioned, it's a different species. But in every one of these trials, basically you have uh, Wasmania with, a, with, with, the, with the lower, numbers of workers than, than the monomorium. And uh, here, the same thing. These are number of live workers. So you have, uh, you have Wasmania with more live workers. After just a few days, no, they will count. They will go to the nest boxes and count the number of workers. And then these are long, the results of longer term studies uh, where the species were interacting, well, longer term for 12 days, like two, almost two weeks. And at the end of this interaction, they will go back to the nest boxes and count the total number of ants. And as you can see, six out of nine experiments, in six out of nine experiments, monomorium workers were exterminated. There were not a single one left. 
not brood, not the queens, nothing was left in, on those, on those net nets, nest boxes. So kind of fairly strong evidence that Wasmania is winning over Monomorium. Uh, again, a different species, but uh, a species that is very similar in terms of behavior uh, than our species in, in the coffee farms. Okay, second pairwise, Monomorium versus Solenopsis. And for that, I'm gonna show you this video. I hope this worked, I forgot to check it, but I hope this worked. Pay attention to this here. Now, this, this interaction here is between the Monomoriums, which are down here, and the Solenopsis. Solenopsis is much bigger than Monomorium, as, and it's a very aggressive ant. The, the Monomorium is kind of a wimpy ant. It's not, it looks superficially like that, but they produce uh, a toxic chemical that, to protect themselves against other ants. And what I want you to see is that this ant, the, the, the video is not that great, <laughs> so you need to, to pay a lot of attention, but you're gonna see how they take the, the abdomen and shift it toward the face or the, the head of the, uh, of the solenopsis and spray something on it. And, and then the solenopsis react to that. So here's the, the video. Pay attention to this one here. You see how it's taking like the abdomen and like pointing it to, toward the solenopsis. And it's, you know, the solenopsis doesn't seem to, to realize it. And then all of a sudden it gets into its antenna and then it starts like, okay, where well, something's happening here and then, ooh, and then start going away. And this one here, this happened really fast, but you can see that it, you know, the ant, the monomorium, shifted the abdomen spray, the, uh, the ant with something, and the ant went running away. So they have their mechanism for actually you know, uh, protecting themselves and actually being aggressive against this, this big aggressive ant, which is Solenopsis invicta. This is the red imported fire ant, by the way. Uh, so we also had some experiments that we did with baits, and I'm showing you just a few of the, of the results, but in each one of these cases, you can see the blue is the monomorium and the red is the, is the solenopsis. And in each case, even sometimes when the solenopsis will discover the bait before the monomorium, eventually the monomorium discovered it and started recruiting and exclude uh, even after the, the solenosis, like in this case, solenosis is getting pretty high in terms of numbers of, of ants. This is time here, and this is the, the number of, of, of individual ants. And solenosis is getting really high, and then Monomorium decide, okay, you're out of here, and they, you know, they start recruiting, and the solenosis goes down. Now, I should say that in a few of the baits, especially the ones that were lower, in the trunk, this, is, this, this was done in trunks of citrus, citrus plants that are intercropped with the coffee. And, and when the baits were lower, the solenopsis will win. And these are two cases of that. So you've, you see this happening when the baits are really low because the solenopsis can find the bait and start recruiting really, really fast. No? So it all depends on how close they are to their nest and how fast they can start recruiting. But overall, it seemed like it's a good possibility that in this system, the, the monomorium is, this, is winning in competition over Solenopsis. And finally, the, the third interaction pairwise would be Solenopsis winning in competition over Wasmania. And uh, this is a study that was just published, actually, uh, it, it, was, it was done in China. It was pu just published this year, this past year. And, uh, and you can see here, this is, this is um, uh, Solenopsis invicta and Wasmania ropuntata, the two same species that we're working with. And in this case, you're talking about here per capita foraging activity, resource acquisition, uh, this, the two upper graphs are uh, when the matching was done on a number of ants, and so worker by worker, so the same number of workers in each nest box. Uh, and this one is, the matching is done by biomass. So the biomass of, uh, of the Wasmania equal to the biomass of the Solenopsis. And in both cases you have here 
uh, Solenopsis winning over Wasmania, although for per capita foraging activity, not as much. This was not significant, a significant difference. But then when you look at uh, mean percent mortality of ants at the end of the experiment, you see that essentially Solenopsis invicta had less mortality than Wasmania ropuntata. And so overall, there seemed to be, you know, supporting the idea that uh, solenopsis can win against Wasmania in competition. We also did some next box experiments, uh, like something like this, where one box will have solenopsis, one box will have Wasmania. We conducted uh, nine trials, and our idea was to conduct, you know, many more trials. But in every single one of these trials, after two or three days, the Solenopsis wiped out the Wasmania. They went to the nest of the Wasmania and basically started, uh, ra you know, started attacking the Wasmania. The Wasmanias were, they were not killed and eaten by the Solenopsis, but the Wasmanias were all by the edge and eventually fell to the you know, drop or committed suicide, went to, in the water. Uh, and basically, the next box was occupied by Solenopsis. So in our own experiments in the lab, we have kind of strong evidence also that, there was ma that, that the Solenopsis uh, are winning in competition against the Wasmania. Another thing, a little bit more natural history here, is the way that Solenopsis forage. And we think that they do that. This is well documented, actually. And we think that the, the reason they have these underground foraging trails, you see here, this will be the, the next mound, and these are foraging trails. And, and then they have these exit holes. So on the ground, instead of foraging on top of the ground, they, have, they build these underground foraging tunnels and then open a hole and then start foraging uh, around that hole. And we think that this is a, a protection against the forage flies that attack them. No? So they have that strategy uh, to, to protect themselves against, against the forids. But this actually could have an impact, and, and I'll talk a little bit more about how we think that this actually have uh, an effect in terms of the distribution of the ants in the field and the displacement of Wasmania by Solenopsis. Okay, so going back here, uh, do we have evidence of intransitive competition? Well, at least looking at these pairwise uh, experiments and observations, it does look like there's a possibility that we can have an intransitive loop going on here. Uh, we, in order to look at this in, 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 uh, in the field, no? the, all this is based on experiments and then some, some field observations. But in order to look at this in the field, we set up a plot and this is, this is a plot in a coffee farm. This is a coffee farm here. And we set up a plot that was about 30 meters by 120 meters long. Uh, there's a road here, and there's a road here, and this is a fence here. So the, the, the farm goes, the coffee goes all the way to here. Uh, and you can see in green is Wasmania, in blue is Monomorium, and in red is Solenopsis. So this farm, is dominated by Wasmania. No? By the time that we started this study, uh, that was in 2019, January 2019, uh, it was dominated by Wasmania. Now, in order to see the dynamics here, you obviously need more than a snapshot of what's going on at one point in time. So we conducted, we have been conducting these surveys uh, for several years. And so this is what you find, what we have found uh, in terms of the distribution of the ants going from January 2019, sampling in the dry season, that is January, and the wet season, which is July, uh, all the way to July 2022, with a one-year gap during the COVID pandemic. So th that year we didn't, we didn't sample. But you can see here now, you begin to see the dynamics and there seemed to be actually uh, this intransitive competition uh, seemed to be uh, realized here in the field. Because if you look at this, and we need to figure out a really good way. Some, if you have really good skill and special analysis and, 
you know, clever ways of uh, analyzing this kind of data, let me know. But uh, I, mean, I, I, I think that is kind of evident here that the Wasmani is being replaced by the solenosis, wouldn't you say so? Like here, you know, this part of the farm is dominated by Solonov by Wasmania, and then Solonovsky start coming in, coming in, coming in, and now it's, you know, repla basically replacing the Wasmania. Uh, then the uh, replacement of Solonovsky by Monomorium, a little bit less clear that, but there's a little bit of evidence of that here, especially, you know, these things might happen at different uh, temporal scale as well, so that's something that needs to be taken into consideration. So I think that here, you know, you start having solenopsis here, and then you know the the monomorium start uh, increasing uh, and kind of displacing the solenopsis. And here we started seeing also that maybe the the uh, wasmania was beginning to displace the monomorium. Here we have a lot of wasmania, then the wasmania uh, kind of disappear, and you have the monomorium, the blue one. But we started seeing some indication in the edge that wasmania was coming in. So we expanded the, we expanded the plot to incorporate more plants. And, and so this is, this is the, east, uh, north, south, east, yeah, the eastern edge of the plot. And so, as you can see here, I mean, this is this is essentially what we had up to here we had before, and uh, you see the wasmanias coming in from here, and displacing some of the monomorium. So again, I think that the evidence of the uh, wasmania displacing monomorium seems to be fairly strong. The evidence of the of the solenopsis displacing the wasmania very strong, and uh, the evidence of the monomorium displacing the solenopsis more or less not, not really, really strong, but some indications of that happening. Now, I want to go back to uh, these underground foraging trails that I mentioned before. Um, and basically, uh, I say, I mentioned something about th thinking that this would play, was playing a role in terms of the displacement of Wasmania by Solenopsis. And we decided to do some ground baitings. So we did some transects. And this, is, this would be, for example, the way I illustrate the, the transect here is a transect that's going, that is a 10 meter transect on the ground with tuna bait every 40 centimeters. So we have 26 baits in the ground. And we place those on the areas that were dominated by wasmania, the areas that were dominated by solenosis, and the areas that were dominated by monomorium. And here's uh, the data. Uh, and you can see that in the area that were dominated by wasmania, on the ground, and you know, this, the, 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 the uh, green fuzzy, green, the, the heat map, refers to the dominance of these species on the coffee bushes. So this is the arboreal the dominance in the arboreal area, so in the coffee plants. And these transects are on the ground, no? Now on the ground, even in the areas that are completely dominated by wasmania, on the plants, there you, you can still see solenopsis on the ground. And they're coming through those underground tunnels. So they build these underground tunnels, they get into the area that's dominated by wasmania, they build these, these, open, these exit holes, and they start foraging in those areas. And slowly but surely, they start gaining territory that way. And eventually, they forage on the plants and basically dominate the plants as well. So you can see that you know, we're here you can see uh, solenopsis on those, those transects. Here, even more solenopsis. Obviously, in the solenopsis area, is completely uh, dominated by solenopsis. There's hardly any any wasmania, and uh, in this area here that's in the arboreal community is dominated by monomorium, the blue is monomorium. On the ground, you don't find any monomorium because monomorium is completely arboreal. No? The monomorium doesn't forage in the ground. So you have basically only solenopsis, but not many baits are occupied by solenopsis. The rest of the baits, all this blank, that you see here in this area here are other species. So that also contribute to species diversity there. 
Now, uh, hey, let me see. For, for three of the transects, we repeated this the year after. So, you know, the same, the same thing, the same data that I showed you before, but in January 2022 and then in January 2023 to see how it, it is changing. And you can see the difference here, January 2022 and then January 2023. Look at all the Solenopsis that is occupying the ground transects, no? Basically, Solenopsis is taking over that area that seemed to be dominated arboreally by, by Wasmania. So we are expecting that eventually the Wasmania is going to disappear from there. It's going to be, all the plants are going to be occupied by Solenopsis. And then the same thing uh, you see here, but even more, more dramatic because it's in an area that is, you know, already being colonized by the Solenopsis. And then finally, here you start seeing some of the, uh, some of the Wasmania coming in uh, in the ground. So I think that uh, I hope I have managed to convince you that uh, we do have an intransitive competitive structure here in this community, at least of these three uh, dominant species in the coffee farm. But you may say, so what? You know? Uh, well, besides the fact that in transitivity, uh, empirically, yeah, there's a lot of work, theoretical work, that has been done in transitive competition, but it hasn't been that much, that well documented empirically in nature, no, with some exception, uh, but it's not, and, and I, I haven't seen anything with the ant community, which, you know, has this very, very long tradition of studies that have been looking at competition. So this would be the first example of an intransitive, uh, competitive loop uh, in the ant community. Uh, but also, uh, we also, uh, from a theoretical perspective, uh, I think you can model the system uh, easily uh, with some, uh, using you know, just simple differential equations, uh, which are, uh, I'm going to show you here. So we have, you know, this this intransitive competition, and I mean, th there's this is work that has been done before. Uh, John, uh, my partner, published this some time ago. Uh, with the same kind of differential equations, and when you have an intransitive loop just like that, the outcome of that uh, depends on the the competition coefficient, no? So you have, uh, going back here, actually, to the equation, this is the competition coefficient, and we're doing the simplest thing possible. All the uh, competition coefficients are the same. So this is very uh, even, basically, you know, same competition coefficient for all the species. And uh, depending on the competition coefficient, when you have a competition uh, coefficient that is higher than two, what you get is a heteroclinic cycle, as I mentioned before. So basically, you get this uh, this community fluctuating between, you know, dominance of of Wasmania, let's say, and then uh, which one comes first? Wasmania, then uh, Monomorium, then Solenopsis, and no, no, the reverse. <laughs> I'm losing track of this. Uh, but anyway, you know, you have. The three species displacing each other and 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 being you know the the highest. So you have this this um, heteroclinic cycle. Eventually, you can have extinction, but the extinction is going to be at random. No. So if you have many of these happening in different places, different farms are going to have a dominance of a different of a different ant, and that would be at random. Uh, if uh, if your competition coefficient is uh, equal to two, then you're going to have uh, these uh, oscillations, and then basically uh, when you have a competition coefficient that is less than two, in this case uh, is 9.1, 1.9, you have a stable focal point, and you have the three species basically uh, uh, persisting in the system. Now, this is, these are not the only three species that are in the system. As I mentioned before, there are a bunch of other species, and this is a list of the species that we have documented in those farms. And so 
uh, we are assuming that many of these species or the rest of the species are arranged in some sort of transitive hierarchy or transitive chain, no? And so what happens when you combine an intransitive loop with a transitive chain? And that is uh, a, something that uh, we are, we're exploring now. And essentially what we're saying here is that what happens when you, know, you have something like this, but one of the species in the intransitive loop is connected to a, in a, in a, in, to a transitive chain or to a transitive hierarchy. You know? And uh, we, we, these, are, these are the, uh, here, these are the equations for that, adding the transitive chain you know, to the system, or in this particular case, it's a transitive hierarchy, because we have H, H here represent the, the uh, competition, basically, of, of the hierarchy, the, the competition of, of you know, Wasmania against all the other three species, the species four against the other species. And these are all, is, H is the same for all the species. So again, the simplest system as possible. And, uh, and when you model that, well, this is, the, this is the intransitive structure, and here's the transitive uh, part connected to the intransitive structure. And when you model that, you're already seeing this, which is just kind of the control, which will be just the, the intransitive loop. And when you connect to this intransitive loop, you connect the transitive, um, the transitive chain or the transitive hierarchy, then what you get is a six-dimension heteroclinic cycle if the competition coefficient is higher than two. Uh, or you get a six-dimensional focal point if the competition coefficient is less than two. And so, again, this, this uh, suggests that you can have the maintenance of more species in the system when you have this kind of arrangement. So intransitivity can uh, promote species diversity in the system and can promote the, the persistence of these species. Now, uh, how much time do I have? A couple of minutes. So I'm going to uh, skip through some of these. And basically, uh, just, just mention that, OK, so this is our idea of how species diversity can be maintained <laughs> in, uh, in the community, in the, in the coffee farms in Puerto Rico. So you have, and this actually, this apply to any system as well. So I think that you know, part of, of uh, our interest in this is that uh, we, we kind of are trying to demonstrate that this, this is working in the ant community in Puerto Rico, but uh, it could be a mechanism for species maintenance uh, in other systems as well. So having these intransitive loops, which have been shown to exist uh, in nature, uh, connected with these transitive chains or transitive hierarchies, could be a mechanism for maintaining species diversity. And finally, I'll just mention that one, when I talk about the literature about competition among ants and how uh, uh, ant communities are structured, I mentioned the the uh, the forage fly. No, that that uh, there's some studies that show that the transitive dominance, you know, the the dominance hierarchy among ants get disrupted by these forage parasitoids, and so we're now incorporating that in uh, in the same type of analysis, saying, okay, when we have uh, this transitive. Uh, intransitive competitive structure, what happens when you add to that a predator-prey system no? on top of that? Uh, with a trade-mediated effect, because the, uh, the forests actually happen to have a, a higher order or a nonlinear effect on, uh, the, on the ants. So Solenopsis has a predator, a, a parasitoid, and this is uh, a forest fly. They were introduced in Puerto Rico, actually, when, uh, to try to control the, the fire ants. And, uh, and so here is a, a, I want you to look at this. Uh, you know, this is the forage fly here. I'm going to show you a video of this. 
uh, the, please don't pay attention to that other ant when I say, I mean, that other fly. When I say a fly, people look at that big fly, and that's not the fly that I'm talking about. It's this little fly that's here. <laughs> And so that's why I put it on, you know, in the circle there. But pay attention to that little dot. Again, not a great video, but it gives you an idea of what's going on here. That's the forid parasitoid, and it's flying over, especially looking for the big ants, the big, because it's, it's polymorphic, so especially looking for the bigger ones. But it's there, and it changes the behavior of the ant. Not as dramatic as the Azteca ants that I talked about yesterday that get paralyzed or completely lower their, their activity, but they do have an effect. Uh, and we're beginning to do the studies to look at the interaction between Wasmania and Solenopsis. Remember I told you that Solenopsis win over Wasmania and is displacing Wasmania? Well, what happens when the forid is present? No, that, that competitive advantage might decrease. And so we're beginning to look at that. Um, and uh, this is the system that we're beginning to model. So you have the predator prey system, that is the, the parasitoid uh, and, uh, and, the, and the solenopsis. And the solenopsis is connected to this intransitive loop. No? And so, but the solenopsis is also being regulated by the, or having, you know, interaction with the forid parasitoid. And that is a, 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 a cyclical uh, system. And so you also, on top of that, have this tray mediated or higher order effect that is alter, basically having an effect, a negative effect on the interaction between solenosis and wasmania. And it's a slightly more complicated than the other system that I show you with the transitive and intransitive competition connected. Uh, but, but these are the, uh, the differential equations to model that system. We began modeling the system. And the cool thing is that um, I don't have a lot of time to, to do that. But what we think is happening here is that you have basically two couple oscillators, no? And it's something like the, the physical system of a couple oscillator where you have here, this would represent basically the forid and the end. And the other oscillator will be the, the other two ant species. And so we are, again, we're beginning to model that system. Uh, we have some preliminary results related to that, uh, but so what I, what I think is happening here is that you have, uh, uh, what is it, a second here. Mm. Oh, yeah, this would be like the forid solenopsis oscillation. And then here you have the Waspania monomorium oscillation, no? And, and so you're, we're expecting to generate some uh, chaotic behavior and it does generate some chaotic behavior, but this is like, again, this is all preliminary. We haven't put a lot of attention yet into the details of this, but if you expand on this, this is chaotic, but it actually makes a lot of sense of you know, what's going on there, and there's some interpretation that you can give to this. Like, for example, if you expand one of these cycles here, this is what you see. And so what you can say is that, for example, here you have the forids depressing the solenopsis, allowing Wasmania to surge. No? And then here you have solenopsis recovering, depressing Wasmania. Then here you have monomorium surge, causing solenopsis to decline. Then here you have, again, the forid depressing solenopsis, allowing Wasmania to surge. Solenopsis recovers, depressing Wasmania. Monomorium surge, causing solenopsis to decline. And this repeats, like, you know, repeats until uh, the forid start peaking again. And then the whole cycle repeats again, uh, you know, for by. 127 iterations or something like that, which is what we have done up to now. 
So again, very preliminary, but I think I, it's, it's, it's really interesting and exciting that we are able to give some interpretation to these graphs and you know this dynamic that you know that we thought it was going to be extremely complicated and not you know not being able for us to to understand at all. But there seems to be something going on there, and you know you have these big oscillations of the predator-prey system, and then these smaller oscillations of the triad of the intransitive loop, and and so that that's that's really exciting. Okay, now again, so what? Uh, well, you know, just to finish off, all these ants, these three species, and then a bunch of the other species that are uh, in in the system. Uh, have some relationship with the pest. And that's one of the things that we're really interested in. And why do you need to understand this whole you know, spatial dynamics of the ants? Well, these ants are having an effect, either positive or negative, on the, uh, on the pest community. And here you see the three main pests that, that are in these farms, the, 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 uh, the coffee leaf miner, the coffee berry borer, and, and the coffee rust. And the ants are related either directly or indirectly with, with these species. And just, just to finish off, I'm going to tell you two stories of two farmers in Puerto Rico related to the ant community. This is Bernardo's story. And this, this is the story of not such a wise man. And then I'll tell you the story of a very wise woman. <laughs> <laughs> and the story of not such a wise man, Don Bernardo, who I love, he's, he's a very good friend of mine. And he has this farm, uh, Café Gran Bate. And uh, this is where we did this study, actually. We have a very strong relationship with this farmer. He was complaining that he has a lot of wasmania. Wasmania is the electric ant. It's a problem in Hawaii. If you've been to Hawaii, people complain like crazy about wasmania because it's thin. And it has a very powerful sting. And it's really tiny, and you don't realize that you have it so until it stings you. And it's, it's really problematic from when people are harvesting the coffee. And so you have complete areas that are dominated by wasmania that people don't enter. You know, They don't harvest the coffee there, because they're going to get sting by this ant. And they prefer not to, not to go into those areas. So it's, it's actually a problem. Uh, and Don, Don Bernardo. Uh, he really wanted to get rid of these ants, no? And, and, you know, what he does is, well, let's find something to get rid of them. So they, he, he got this pesticide, he sprayed it all over the farm, and basically got rid of the wasmanias. This was in, this was in, a, in, an, in an area different from the one that we had, uh, that we were doing the, the study, and this was several years before we were doing the study. And he decided to apply this pesticide to get rid of all the wasmania. And he got rid of all the wasmanias. But the next year, after he got rid of all the wasmania, he got this. And it was an outbreak of the coffee leaf miner. We have now evidence that the wasmania actually is uh, contributing to depress the coffee leaf miner. So getting rid of the wasmania was not such a great idea. Um, and then finally, this is the story of Doña Librada, a very wise woman. And this is in Cuba, actually, not in Puerto Rico. And Doña Librada eh, had the same problem. You know, she's a coffee farmer. She harvests the, the coffee herself. And she complains all the time about the, the wasmania, you know, this, this ant, uh, because it's sting and all that. But she also has observed that the wasmania actually can pray or pray. Sometimes she has seen the wasmania praying on the coffee berry board. I told her that they pray also on the coffee leaf miner, so she was really happy about that. Uh, but she also knows of another ant that she has observed. This is Fidoli megacephala, again, another non-native ant, but Fidoli megacephala that prays or basically fight very strongly and can displace, displace the wasmania. So what she does is that she wants to keep the wasmania on her plants during most of the year, but get rid of it during the harvest season, no? Because that's when people are harvesting. So what she does is that she actually transplant the nest of the Pidoli megacephala to the plants that are heavily infected with the wasmania, 
the, the Fidoli megacephala start foraging, displace the wasmanias, but te only temporarily because they don't like the habitat in the coffee farm. They like just basically by the edges. They, are, they live in very disturbed open areas. And so they live there for a while, and eventually they just move away back to the roadside or something like that. And then the wasmania comes back, and you know they can do their job preying on the pest. So that is why it's important to understand you know, the diversity of this ant community. There are many different issues uh, related to the ants, many different um, functions that the ants have. But also, in, just in terms of pest management, you have some ants that are very small and can penetrate the holes and eat the, the, the brood of the coffee berry borer, others that are bigger and can prey on the coffee berry borer when they're outside, uh, some, that are, some that are completely arboreal, some that are completely terrestrial and can pre prey on the, pet, on the berries when they're in, on the ground. So there are this, this complementarity uh, effects that, that can happen, and I think it's important to try to get a better understanding on, on how this community is changing, what are the forces that are, or the factors that are contributing to the changes in this community to try to be, have a better uh, idea of how to manage then this ant community. But it looks like some farmers don't need, not, don't need our, our help. You know, they can figure things out by themselves, but some of them do. And so with that, I want to thank you. And again, I'm sorry that I went over, like always, but um, thank you very much. Is there time for questions? Yeah, I think there's yeah. time for just a few questions because it's getting late. So does anybody have a question? And if nothing pops up, I, you, what you just said at the end, I, oh, we've got a question. Good. <laughs> and remember to hold the mic. So okay. that this I was just curious if the forehead flies are only parasitizing the Solenopsis. Yeah. They're pretty specialized. Okay. They are very specialized. Yeah. Okay. And they, they, these, there were two species that were introduced specifically to try to control the, the, the ants. Yeah. Okay. Yvette, do you have a sense if the, uh, the forehead flies are actually leading to long-term declines in the populations of the Solenopsis? Like, is it working as a biocontrol program? Uh, I don't have any data to show that. And people have not been doing monitoring of the, of the Solenopsis on, on, at the level of the entire island. So I don't know. I do know that they do have some effect but it's not as strong as you might think. Like, you know, I, I, I have the example of the forehead flies and the Azteca ants, and they have a very strong effect on the Aztecas uh, behaviorally. Not that much in terms of, like, you know, killing uh, a lot of individuals, but behaviorally. Now, I know that in other places that the forests have been introduced and they haven't been able to displace the, the fire ants, yeah. In Texas, for example, and other places that, that they, they, they've been introducing for its, yeah. So your story at the end, uh, I don't know if I've ever seen sort of analysis of biological control that sort of is dynamic, this idea of you do something at part of the year but not the whole year, et cetera. Is that true? And if so, are you thinking about? Yeah. Yeah, well, this was the first time, actually, that we, we were in Cuba and uh, – and we visited this farm. And you know, we, we weren't even talking about the, uh, the, the Wasmania, the, the Bibihawa. And the farmer just started talking about, oh, yeah, I mean, I have, I have this problem with the ants that they, they sting. Oh, somebody got sting by the, by the Wasmania. And she just started saying, and you know, one of the reasons that she knew about the other species was because that other species, um, uh, Fidoli megacephala, which is called Almiga leona, the lion ant in Cuba, they have a whole biological control program with that particular species that have been spread all over Cuba, and where they actually, they even have what is called, what they call refuges 
or reservoirs, reservoirs of Fidoli megacephala. They put little trunks of uh, plantain plants. You know, the, the, the plantain plants are, have a lot of, uh, uh, they're, they're very uh, like uh, humid and have, you know, it's not very woody. It's not woody at all, actually. And they cut the plants, the banana plants or the plantain plants, and they put these little trunks in the ground with sugar and the, the, the Fidoli megacephala move their nest to that area and then they, they cover it with uh, the leaves to maintain the moisture and transplant them to the, the sweet potato fields. And in the sweet potato fields, they take the leaves off, the stem dries out, force the ants to go under the ground and then they start preying on the, uh, the Tetuan del Boniato. This, this is a pest uh, of the sweet potatoes. Now that I think about it, it's actually also a temporal system because the, the, the Fidoli megacephala actually eventually moves out of those areas. Okay. And, so, and the, so they need to keep transplanting this nest. But she got the idea from knowing this system in the sweet potato fields and observing that the ant was having an effect on the other ant, the one that she wanted to get rid of. But it was amazing to me that, you know, she thought about that and that it, it actually, she said that it worked. You know, I never saw it functioning, but she said, yeah, it's, it works well. So maybe uh, we should give Yvette a break. She's had a long and busy two days, and let's thank her again. And, thank uh, you very much.